Hello, 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 hello. I'm Marshall Goldsmith. Welcome to 100 Coaches Live on LinkedIn Live. A lot of lives here. And I'm going to briefly introduce myself and then we're going to begin. Uh, I'm an executive coach uh, for years, got ranked number one coach. Uh, also, I'm an author, written or edited 41 books, three big selling books, and many books purchased only by my mother, my father, and relatives. Then also, uh, I'm a teacher and educator, traveling all around the world, giving talks about leadership and teaching. And then, you know, I came up with an idea years ago from my friend Aisha Bursell. She said, who are your heroes? My heroes were kind and generous people. She said, you ought to be more like them. I decided I would adopt 15 people, teach them all I know for free. And the only thing is when they get old, they got to do the same thing. It's called pay it forward. I made a little selfie video and put it on LinkedIn. I thought maybe 100 people would apply, and I'd adopt 15. Turned out over 18,000 people have applied, and I've adopted 250. And these are just amazing, amazing, amazing human beings. I'm so honored to be able to even know such people. And our guest today is just a, a fantastic person. Our guest today is Jim Citrin. Now, in most fields, there's a debate. Who's best? Who's number one in this field? In the world of CEO recruitment and selection, there is no debate. The number one person in the world, partner at Spencer Stewart, noted author is my good friend, Jim Citrin. Not only is he the number one person in his world, he's also a good guy. He tries to help others. He's proud of his family. So he's just a good human being as well. So Jim, welcome, welcome, welcome. Can you take just a minute or two, briefly introduce yourself and we'll get rolling. Super, Marshall. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here with you, and I'm proud to be your friend and be a participant in this great enterprise of helping others with their lives, with their careers. Yes, I'm a, I'm a partner at Spencer Stewart, which is the world's leading executive recruitment and advisory firm. I've been here 26 years. I'm based in Riverside, Connecticut, which is right outside the epicenter of the COVID crisis in New York but it's beautiful out right now and lovely. Um, as I said, 26 years here at Spencer Stewart where I lead our CEO practice. I was in professional services before that at McKinsey and I work around the world uh, on CEO searches, board searches, succession planning and leadership development. And I just love what I do. I love, love my 2,500 Spencer Stewart colleagues around the world and uh, you know, we're all working through difficult times right now, but it's also a great opportunity to reflect on what's important and how to deal with this crisis and uh, where we're going. Now, you know, I've got a good heart, but a bad memory. I, I forgot you worked for McKinsey. Yeah, yeah, that's where it's interesting. I, I, I started there after, after Harvard Business School and uh, I worked in, in New York and in Paris, France. And I really learned how to serve clients, how to write, how to think. And uh, I also learned the value of intellectual capital as an input Ooh. into what we did. And we probably wouldn't be sitting here today uh, without that because at McKinsey, the idea is to do research and come up with insights and then use that to become a thought leader. And that's sort of how yeah. the firm really marketed itself. And at Spencer Stewart, uh, we're the very, we're the same. And I haven't done 41 books like you, but I've done seven. Uh, and it's been a fascinating learning journey and adding value along the way. But I credit that to my time back in my late twenties and early thirties. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know if I was working at McKinsey when you were there, but we did training and development for tons of people back in McKinsey. The director of training was a guy named Harvey Gollum at the time, who later on became, of course, CEO of American Express, you know, a real good guy. So I have, yeah, you know, spent years with, with McKinsey, so it's a, a, a connection I forgot that we had. Now, I've got a few questions for you. Oh, and I always forget this. I want everybody to use the chat box and write in questions for Jim. This is a unique opportunity for you to ask a question to the number one person in the world and what he does, and very honored he's with us today. Also a member of our wonderful 100 Coaches group. Question number one, what's new? What is your focus on now? And how's this evolved over the past six weeks during this crisis? 
Well, at, at Spencer Stewart Marshall, we work with, we probably do 5,000 CEO, CFO, board director recruitments a year across the world. Mm -hmm. And I personally have lead between 20 and 30 CEO searches, board searches mm -hmm. and, uh, over the course of a year. Um, and it's a breakneck pace, you know, the, uh, through 20, 2019, the, the economy was great, new businesses were being uh, created, new investments were made, and there was a lot, actually a lot of CEO turnover. In fact, 2019 was one of the years of the greatest number of CEO transitions in the US and in countries around the world. So we were incredibly busy running to work with boards to define things and then place, place CEOs and other top leaders. It has mm -hmm. changed a lot six weeks but in ways that have been quite different than what you know anyone might have expected because there's innovation happening there's courage that's being taken there's necessity that is creating innovation as well and um, I guess rather than just doing things more of the same we've adopted how we're doing it certain boards are having to make decisions I'll give you one example this is, was just announced uh, two days ago uh, eBay, the $30 billion global marketplace, just announced a new CEO, a wonderful guy, Jamie Iannone. He was the COO of Walmart's e-commerce business, and mm -hmm. he is the CEO. We and I personally and our Spencer Stewart, we led that process. And for the first kind of six weeks of that process at the beginning of the year, it was tr pretty s straightforward, normal, intense. We worked with the board to define the CEO spec and the leadership requirements. We did a lot of research. We cultivated candidates. We had an internal candidate and we we got down to the finalists. But at the time that the search committee was set to meet the finalists, the world shut down and we yeah. switched literally. It was the Sunday night before everyone was flying to Menlo Park for the, to, to do three days of search committee interviews. We went to virtual and the the board never met the finalist candidates and we went through that process. It was quite extraordinary. Uh, but I think there are now a lot of companies that are having to do things that they never would have thought was possible uh, up until now. And now they're doing it. So that was uh, just one example of how. But the other thing I'd say that how the world has changed for, for us is I think a lot of boards are taking a a different look at their leadership now on two two mm -hmm. bases, one very short term and one a little longer term. Short term, emergency succession planning. A number of companies, their CEOs have either gotten sick or they're planning for what would happen if they do get sick. And so we at Spencer Stewart mm -hmm. have worked with dozens of boards right now on developing an emergency succession plan. So that's the short term. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that a lot of boards now are saying, okay, we need to think more strategically about our long or medium term succession planning. So we're doing tons of that over the last six weeks as well. So that's a quick snip, snippet, a uh, snapshot of how the uh, human business. Now, if you had to say, let's talk about boards first, then we're going to go into leaders. If you had to look at boards, some of the boards moving forward. Uh, what are some of the advice you have and what are the learnings you have of looking at boards dealing with this kind of stuff in the recent weeks at the board of director level? It's kind of said in the world of governance and, and corporations that boards really earn their keep in times of challenge. And whether it's a crisis like we're dealing with, whether it was the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, or whether it's some other kind of uh, localized crisis in a, uh, uh, an activist situation or a takeover or some other kind of regulatory situation, boards really uh, earn their keep in, in these times. And I've seen some boards absolutely lean in, come together, be there as a, as a support mechanism to a CEO and his or her management team, offering really practical mm -hmm. advice and, and emotional support and also strategic support. Uh, I, I, I think right now, from what I've certainly seen, most of the boards that I've worked with are all kind of stepping up. They're embracing this as a leadership moment 
and uh, yeah. and and doing some really good work right now. Now, in terms of leaders, and again, and if you don't feel comfortable mentioning that, you can mention um, kind of what they're doing or the job they're in. But so what are some leaders that right now you think are really being inspirational? If you can't mention their names, great. If you cannot mention the name, you could say a leader and describe what they're doing. No, no, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to mention uh, real people. I think uh, I, I, I see some beautiful things happening right now, and and most most companies uh, and most organizations are really having their priorities right about taking care of their employees and their employees' families' health first, and then having a set of principles that they're operating by, but. I've always been a big believer that kind of the first leadership principle is leadership by example, but that's more right. important than ever in a time of crisis and how they are out there, how they're communicating, what they're saying, how they're spending their time is really extraordinary. So just as I'll name, I'll name a few that I'm, I'm just incredibly proud of and, and, I, and I'm inspired by Kevin Johnson, the CEO of Starbucks. To me, one of the great CEOs in the world, uh, he he was because of Starbucks' unique global portfolio. They've been three to six weeks ahead of the crisis than most certainly American-based companies. They have a, about ten percent of their business in China, and in January they were taking aggressive action, and they've been able to see this move around the world. And they have a philosophy of taking care of their they call them, they call their employees partners, taking care of Starbucks partners first and taking care of their customers and worrying about the financials and all of that as a, as a follow through. There are examples that, that through Hans's, I mean, through um, Kevin's leadership, uh, people have stepped up within the company. And uh, so that's a really beautiful thing, but clear communications and, and, and having daily or weekly updates about all sorts of things. Another one, I, I, I mentioned Hans a second ago, what I was going to say is Hans Vestberg, the CEO of Verizon. Verizon and other technology and telecommunications companies are truly essential, allowing many people who have the opportunity to work from home or work remotely to do that on the back of networks and communications and transaction processing and all these things. And uh, uh, Verizon, uh, fantastic company, Hans, uh, has really inspired that workforce uh, to be out there and, and serving their, their constituents. Um, in the healthcare world, there's so many examples of frontline people, literally the nurses and doctors and the responders there, but also at the, at the corporate level, some of the healthcare companies, Gail Boudreau, the CEO of Anthem Health, she's doing extraordinary things turning their massive company to serve customers right now and leveraging technology and communications. Um, so those are just a few just by, by name, but I think the principles uh, are quite common across the top visible leaders all the way down. And they say, we can talk about that if you'd like. You know, first is, I just want to reinforce one thing you've said, I think it applies to leaders at all levels, lead by example. I mean, lead by example is always important. Yet, as you say, during the times of crisis, it becomes really important. And also, I think employees are really sensitized to the importance of lead by example. When the leaders don't do things they should, when they don't lead by example, when they ask employees to do things they do not do themselves, it's just painful. So I think, number one, that's a great example. It applies not only to the wonderful leaders that you talked about, but to everybody listening here who's either a leader or a coach or a consultant helping other leaders. And number two, a suggestion I would have based on what you said you learned from Starbucks is learn from around the world. Now, I've had the privilege of being on calls every day with people who represent probably 30 different countries. And I get to hear what's happening. And just like Starbucks learn from people around the world, I would encourage everyone in this call to learn from people around the world. Uh, maybe I'm gonna do some of these LinkedIn live calls where we just have international day. And we maybe one day we have Asia, learn from what people are doing in China, learn what people are doing in Japan, 
learn what people do in Italy. There are other countries that have gone through this before us. We have done a woeful job of learning from them. And I think it's a great opportunity to learn from people around the world. Now, Justin, uh, we've had the opportunity to share some of our ideas. Do you have any good questions or comments from the from the people viewing that you would like to share with, with me and with Jim? Yes, Jim and Marshall, good morning. Uh, yeah, first question comes from Jenny Anderson. Says, uh, what skill do you think is the most important right now for leaders to have? Okay, Jim. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll jump in, Jenny. That's a, a great question. Um, and in fact, I'm working with a number of boards right now. To the, the the question they're asking is, to what extent do we adapt our leadership criteria? for CEO succession or selection right now to adapt to this. Um, I think number one is, um, is the ability to be resilient themselves and to encourage through the fortitude and the resilience of, of the organization. And that comes from a number of things. That comes from, from I, we talked about leadership by example, but I think the ability to be purposeful and to be visible as a leader and to be a great communicator. I think communications right now is more important than ever before. If we all look through history, uh, whether it was government leaders, military leaders, corporate leaders, uh, the ability to seize the moment to really define the situation, that communications ability right now is more important than, than ever. And then to tap into deep purpose, and then I'd say to really be a clear thinker. Uh, if you uh, if you look at the winners of of who which organizations came out of prior recessions uh, ahead of the game and what likely to be the the kind of the winning uh, approach, if you will, coming out of this crisis. I think it's a combination of two things, and this is based on a lot of academic research. Number one is to take the Kind of the be humane and purposeful on the people side, but make the structural decisions about what needs to change, let's say from a cost point of view in the short term. But it's not just taking costs out across the board or willy nilly. It's actually to use the, the crisis, who I, whether I forget whoever said, you know, never waste a good crisis, but use the crisis to take costs out and restructure operations in a way that might not have been possible when everything was flush. Simultaneously, having the clear mind about what will be the right investments that can be made now so that when we come out of it, it'll pay off. So it's a combination of restructuring now, selected investments all wrapped around purpose and people. I know that's saying a lot, but that's really what, uh, what I believe. You know, Jim, one thing I want to take a second is in my history, um, I used to so that's kind of what I did for many, many, many years. And now um, I always found a lot of stuff that applied to CEOs applied to all leaders. And one thing I'd like to say is I really haven't heard you say much of anything that doesn't apply to all leaders. I mean, look at potential future investments. Every leader should be thinking about that. How can you just not take out costs to take out costs, but really use this as a choiceful opportunity to look at what are the areas that are most important? How can we prioritize? So I'm tell me what you think. So far, I think pretty much 100% of what you've said not only applies to CEOs, it applies, number one, to every leader who's listening, and number two, hopefully learning from all the coaches of these people. You know, it's such a great point. I mean, I, I wrote a book called The Five Patterns of Extraordinary Careers, Marshall, and that looked at the, the five distinguishing characteristics that accelerated people to the very top of the pinnacle. And the most important thing that I found there was that what it takes to be, you know, in the top 1% of performers can be applied as an entry level, uh, new trainee, as a manager, as a division person, this idea of focusing on the success of others, genuinely caring, leading by example, making tough decisions. You don't have to be the CEO. So for everyone who is, is there, this is people love and are craving leadership. They always do, but never more than now. 
you can be leading a little virtual for three people and it's the same principles. I think it was the great Japanese uh, samurai warrior back in the Middle Ages or whenever he wrote uh, Miyamoto Musashi. Um, he wrote the Book of Five Rings and I'll never forget this, this mm -hmm. concept of to lead 10,000 people, lead 10 people. In other words, if you can really focus on the success of the group of 10 people, it's the same principles, that's scalable leadership. So I agree, Marshall, it's at all, at all levels. And you know, the stuff I teach, Jim, you've been to my programs before. I mean, it's, it's amazingly simple stuff. I have a funny story. I was working with one CEO and executive team. And, you know, I mean, well, you've heard what I teach. Ask for input, listen, think, thank people, follow up. None of this is particularly rocket science. I work with one group, and I think they were a little arrogant. And one of the executives said, do you have a toned down version for people at lower levels in the company? And I said, how toned down can you get, right? I said, I'm giving you the toned down version. Well, you know, I think that the great principles of leadership apply at all levels and our stakeholder coaching, it applies for CEOs, it applies for first line supervisors, it applies for pretty much everybody. So I, that's what I love about what you're saying. It does apply to the big CEOs. It also applies to every leader, I think at every level and everyone can contribute in their own way. Now, uh, just one more question. Let me go ahead, go ahead. on that for a second. Let me just twist that a little bit. People usually think CEOs kind of have it all, and then it's the people more junior who kind of are figuring it out. I'd actually twist that a little bit. And a lot of the advice that I give to aspiring CEOs or CEOs is the basic stuff, which is be a normal well-adjusted, authentic person. You can be vulnerable. You don't have to be Superman or Superwoman and have everything. Being normal and well-adjusted is really underappreciated the more senior you get. And when you are these authentic leaders, to co coin your phrase, that's so much more powerful. So sometimes it's the people at the top who need to remember what, what they were just when they were normal, regular, earlier stage folks. You know, Justin, again, thank you. And Justin, back to the back to you and the people at Methods. Number one, thank you for putting all this on. You guys are doing a great job. I uh, tell people how to get to the archives. So they can look up all the shows after the fact, like and watch this show again or give it to others. And then ask me the final question. And then, Jim, I've got one final one for you after that. So, Justin, fire away. Here I am. Okay, so uh, the best way to get a hold of all the past archive of shows from Methods with Marshall Goldsmith and Jim today and, and all the great shows we've been producing over the COVID crisis and will continue to do after is by going to methodsof.com slash methods. I'm oh, sorry, slash network. It's on the screen there. Uh, methodsof.com slash network. Uh, you can get in there, no charge, and access all past episodes. Uh, last question, Jim, it looks like you have a fan in the audience. Uh, this person has uh, read your book. Uh, Dominic Shepard here says, you wrote the book, The Career Playbook, uh, which has advice for young professionals trying to choose the right field or position to catapult their careers. How does your advice change today given our current environment? Well, Dominic, thank you so much. The Career Playbook, I'm probably so proud of that because it is the idea of taking everything I've learned working with boards and CEOs, but applying it for people who are coming out of school or in the first five or 10 years of their career. Um, the key principle in there, which now how we can apply that is, if possible, try and join fields that are growing because again, it's so obvious, but growth creates opportunity. And right now there's a massive shift to the world of healthcare, health technology, and other things that are allowing people to do work in ways that will add value and solve problems that weren't necessarily yeah. top of mind before. Even, even some of the basic businesses that people took so for granted. I mean, I'm so proud of going to the market, you know, going to Kroger or Walmart and, and, and just being, getting the things we need. But I do think that healthcare, health technology, things that a lot will allow people to thrive coming out of this, that's a great growth mm -hmm. area. Some of the infrastructure that is going to allow, I think, 
the future of work is, I think we all realize is going to be quite different, whether that's three months from now or six months or 18 months from now. So the principle is to go, to quote Wayne Gretzky, uh, skate to where the puck is going. And that is these growth areas. And so that would be the, the way to go. Excellent, excellent. Now, finally, Jim, have I ever showed you my watch exercise and clock exercise? No. All right, and I have a question for you. Don't turn around. Behind you, you have a, a clock. Does it have Arabic okay. numbers or Roman numbers? It has Roman numbers. It's a clock uh, from the early 1900s. Okay. What does Roman numeral 10 look like? The numeral 10? Yeah, Roman numeral 10. It's an X. X. Of course. What does Roman, Roman numeral 4 look like? Uh, I, you know, IV. IV, very good. Turn around and look at the clock. What is the four look okay. like? In this case, it's four, uh, it's four single, uh, single lines. So I never looked at that. <laughs> is that the point? I'm not observing. How many years have you had that clock? About 30. That's funny. 30. Seen it thousands of times. No, you never noticed. But never. Never noticed. I'm going to share something. In life, we don't see what's there. We see what we think is supposed to be there. So, Jim, <laughs> I just taught you the great clock lesson. Thank you very much. By the way, almost all Roman numeral clocks have four eyes. No one ever knows this, almost never. I've done this people over 40 years, never saw it. So the Roman god Jupiter symbol was an IV, considered sacrilegious to put the, they didn't have a J or a U, so I, IV was Jupiter, considered sacrilegious to put on a sundial. The Swiss copied the sundial and making the watch or clock. About 95% have four eyes. I've done this with thousands of people. Almost no one ever says it. Like and by the way, including my friend, the world's number one, Recruitment for CEOs, succession for CEOs, Jim Citron. And Jim, I never thought I'd have the opportunity to teach you a little something today, so you've made my day. Thank you so much wow. for joining us today. It's my honor to have you with us. You're a great guy. What I love about what you do is, although you work with some of the top leaders in the world, what you talk about applies to every leader in the world, I think. And it applies not only to that, every coach, everybody. So very honored for you to be here. Thank you so much. Would love to have you come back again if you don't mind sometime. And goodbye to everybody. Thank you for joining us. I always close with this. I'm a Buddhist. Buddhist said, I only do what I teach if it works for you. We're going to give you as many ideas as we can. Look, these are hard times. My mission is to help everybody that's a viewer as best I can. And and really introduce you to some of the smartest people that I've ever met in my life. And, and hopefully these people will be able to help you just a little bit. And so please take this all the which is spirit to which it's given, just trying to help a little bit. So thanks to all the viewers. Thank you very much. And Jim, thank you so much. Honored to have you here. And Justin, thank you for the methods people. So bye-bye.